Thank you, Jim, and uh, thank you, Bourne, very much for that testimony. You know, it's a privilege to have Bourne, to know Bourne and to have him as a son-in-law, and also to know Frank and Donnie. And, you know, you saw, you saw their children there a few times. Uh, those are Jonathan and Christian and Tito. But uh, they, they have an amazing testimony, and it certainly has been uh, challenging to us. You know, we're going to begin to look at marriage this week. Tim's going to share with us. <clears throat> and <clears throat> initially, we're going to look at it uh, right from the very beginning. And now, for those of you who have been watching the World Series, don't be confused. It's not the big inning. It's in the beginning with God. <clears throat> And so today, let's, uh, as a uh, scripture passage, let's look at Genesis 1, 26. We're going to read uh, the remainder of chapter, 20, uh, chapter 1, excuse me, and then all of chapter 2, uh, beginning with Genesis 1, 26. Excuse me. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the heavens, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning, the sixth day. Thus the, <clears throat> chapter 2, verse 1. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. <clears throat> These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that God made the earth and the heavens. When no bush of the field was yet in the land and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not yet caused it to rain on the land and there was no man to work the ground. And a mist was going up from the land and was watering the whole face of the ground. Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from, Lord God <clears throat> formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A river flowed out of Eden to water the garden, and there it divided and became four rivers, the name of the first is the Pishon. <clears throat> it is the one that flowed around the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold. And the gold of that land is good, but Delium and Onyx stone are there. The name of the second river is the Gihon. It is the one that flowed around the whole land of Cush. And the name of the third river is the Tigris, which flows east of Assyria. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. So out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. 
And while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, This is at last, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Tim, would you um, come on up and join me? At least six feet away, maybe. <laughs> Let me pray for Tim as we uh, begin to look into his word about marriage. Father, we do thank you for this time. Thank you we come and worship you and, and sing. And uh, uh, we can even zoom in and enjoy fellowship from a distance, if that's the way it works best. But thank you most of all for your word. And Lord, we thank you for its perfect design, your perfect design, and its description of it, even in marriage, and even from a very early point in time, that you designed it, designed marriage, and you designed the way it worked. So Lord, we uh, commit this time to you. We pray for Tim, that you would Use him that you would anoint his words and that <clears throat> the words he shares and your word would uh, touch our hearts and uh, draw us to, to you, draw us to your understanding of marriage. And so we commit this time to you and we thank you and we pray these things and come to you confidently in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Gary. <clears throat> Well, in the um, grand pantheon of passages of Scripture that make people mad, I would say Ephesians 5 is one of them, right? So we are still in Ephesians, even though we're going back to... I'm not going to go through the whole Bible to get to Ephesians. I, I'm, I promise you that, unless the Lord tells me to. But... We're still in Ephesians, we're in chapter 5, and we've finished up that area, that section on the filling of the Holy Spirit and walking in wisdom, and it seemed very appropriate to me uh, to take the time uh, to, look, uh, to look at our culture, where we are right now, and talk about what it means to walk in wisdom in light of the circumstances that we find ourselves in. And by the way, I just want to say to you, I know, I, I know that this is hard for you. I know that wearing a mask at church and, you know, getting out of the car and walking up to Winn-Dixie and getting to the door and realize you left your mask in the car, you know, everything's got 10 extra steps added to it, and it's like walking under 200 feet of water. The whole of our life feels so murky, so messed up, and on top of that, uh, our culture is on edge in a way that I don't remember, honestly, since... Um, uh, I, w I watched the documentary uh, the other day on the 1968 Democratic Convention in Chicago, and it was at the height of the Vietnam War and all the protests that were going on and people were being shot. And I remember that as a teenager, uh, but I didn't have a, a coherence uh, as a teenager about what was happening in the, in the broader world. But I remember the tension of those moments. And I was thinking the other day, you know, we're at that place. And it doesn't take much. It's just like one wrong look. It doesn't even take a word. Uh, one wrong look can set off a conflagration that then goes viral because somebody always is videoing uh, what we do. So our calling in this, guys, is patience and kindness and perseverance. This is our God uh, taking the church and stripping us down uh, from all the things that are comfortable to us and are convenient to us and, and bringing us to a greater Christ-likeness in this moment. Uh, just remember, every time you're standing in line and somebody's giving you a hard time or whatever the case may be, remember Jesus standing before Pilate. Remember the bruises and the blood. And remember what Peter says, that he did not speak a word. Even though he was reviled, he did not revile back. And Go back and look at all those passages. This is a time for us to learn patience and kindness. It's a time to 
take it on the cheek and turn the other cheek. There was a, a, a long time in our society that being a Christian was a social positive, right? Uh, the way our founders founded this nation, the way the Constitution, our founding doc documents were written, the freedom of religion and so forth that we've enjoyed, uh, we're not there anymore. It's no longer a social advantage to be a Christian and to be known as a Christian. There's a real tension out there about us. And we need to be, as Jesus said, shrewd as serpents and harmless as doves. And be aware that our enemy will bait us over and over and over again. So just pray for one another, stay close to one another, love one another, and, and be patient, and learn patience and perseverance. And nothing does that more, I think, than uh, being married and having children. So we're going to spend some time on that. We're going to just get started today, um, and uh, we're going to take our time, and we're going to work our way to Ephesians 5, because if you just stand up and talk about wives submitting to their husbands and husbands loving their wives as Christ loved the church, if you do, if you do that without, without the, the backstory of how we got there to that passage, then it's fraught with all kinds of misunderstanding. Everything we believe about the Bible is encapsulated in the first three chapters of the book. What we learn in Genesis 1, 2, and 3 is the foundation and the seeds of every doctrine that we have. And, and, and beyond that, it is the foundation and the understanding of why we are the way we are and why we live the way we do and how we re relate and don't relate to one another. So the principles that we find in Genesis 1, 2, and 3 are not just about marriage, they're about all human relationships. And so you may be sitting here going, well, I'm not married, so I, get to, I can take a nap. Just, no, don't do that. Uh, um, what we're going to learn in Genesis 1, 2, and 3 in the next couple of weeks is, is that God created us as human beings in his image and that there are very specific things that tell us why we are the way we are, why we interact the way we do, and how that helps us whether we're married or not. And speaking of singleness, I am going to address that question a little bit later, a couple weeks from now. But Lori Harlow has said, if you are a single woman uh, or a widow, uh, single by uh, being widowed, she is interested in starting a Bible study with you. So if you're interested in that, see Lori after church. I told Lori, do this if I forget. So, uh. so what I want to do this morning uh, with a, a few minutes we have left is I just want to walk through the passage in Genesis 1 and 2, work our way through it, and then the handout that you have is, uh, is the sort of 30,000-foot view. Once you've gotten through the details of Genesis 1 and 2 and 3, the handout sort of stands up above it and gives you some things, some conclusions uh, that we come to as we look at the text, and we'll get to that uh, next week. But let's look. Very, very well known for most Christians. Uh, verse 26 of uh, Genesis chapter 1, God said, let us make man in our image. Stop right there. That's, that's the beginning of, it's not the only uh, reference to uh, Trinitarian God, but that in the Hebrew, that's a, that's a plural. So we have the, uh, at least the seeds of the idea that will be developed later when we learn about God is really uh, and, uh, and us and uh, one God at the same time. But it says, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, over the livestock, and over all earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So, verse 27, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Now, already we're into controversy, right? This is, this is profoundly important to us as, as the people of Jesus, as the people of God in this culture. Uh, when, when Satan attempted to uh, attack uh, God's people, he always, he always attacks the word of God. So we have here this idea that God is a being in relationship. And so what we know about us is that we are uh, created in his image to be a being in relationship. And we know that God created male and female. 
Let me say that again. God created male and female. I can't rationalize that out of the text. I can't soften that. I understand that because of what happened in Genesis 3 that there's all kinds of misunderstanding and perversions and differences and, and, and so forth of who we are and our gender identity and all that. And, I, and, and believe me, I have tremendous compassion in that area uh, for people who are wrestling with that question. People that are very dear to me People that I love with all my heart are wrestling with those questions. So I'm not sitting in judgment about that. But I cannot, I cannot rationalize out of the text that the original t intent of God in his creation is that there would be male and female. And those two both would represent the image of God. And, in, and I think uh, we could say that those two in relation to each other, it gives even a fuller understanding of God as a being in relationship. Do you understand what I mean by being in relationship? Uh, what I'm saying to you is that before there was ever a Bible, before Jesus ever came and died on the cross, before the world was created, before uh, there was a resurrection, before there was a, an ascension, before there was Pentecost, before there was anything that's important to us. Long before, when everything was all darkness, there was God in relationship. So to be in his image means that at minimum we are beings who are created to be in relationship. And that's why both the Old and the New Testament are so strong on this issue of how we relate to one another. And what does it mean to be created in the image of God? Well, God is spiritual, so he's given us a spirit. And as much as I love my cat, who sits on my lap a lot and sometimes shows up on Zoom, uh, you know, in the meetings, uh, my cat, whom I care for very much, and I think in some weird way cares for me, she does not have a spirit in the same way that you and I have a spirit. Now, I do believe that our pets will be with us in eternity. I believe that because I believe heaven is about happiness and God created animals to give us joy, and so I, I don't have a problem with that. But, but there's something about the way we're created uh, spiritually that's different from any other creature. God is rational. He has the capacity to think and make decisions. He has created, created us to be rational. God is very emotional, by the way. God's very emotional. The strongest emotions in the entire Bible are the emotions that God has. So there's a purified, perfect, holy version of all the, uh, the emotions that we feel. So God is spiritual. He's rational. He's emotional. He's volitional. He chooses. And he's created us with the capacity to make choices that go beyond uh, the way the animals are, the creatures are. They live by instinct. We live by volition, the capacity to choose. And God is immortal, and he's created us with the capacity to live forever. So that's, that's my best attempt at explaining what we mean by uh, being created in the image of God. And we find the seeds of our understanding of marriage in this verse because God creates uh, a male and a female. Now, chapter 1 is sort of the summary of the creative process, and chapter 2 dips down, goes back and dips down into all the detail of it. And so what is it says? God blessed them, verse 28, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, and over the living things that moves on the earth. And he said, I've given you seeds for planting. I've given you all the fruit of, that you can ever eat. And God provided everything for them. And he saw what he had created in verse 30 when he said, it's very good. So here you have this situation where God has created the world, created all of the world, created this special planet where he's going to do a redemptive work. Uh, my own personal belief and understanding of scripture is that at, in that process was when uh, Lucifer led the rebellion in heaven and a third of the angels fell. And when Lucifer fell, he fell into the earth. And that's why it says, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth and the earth was uh, without form and it was void and there was chaos and darkness. That's where Satan fell. 
And so when God created a man and a woman and put the, those two people on this planet, that was an act of war on the part of God. That was his establishing a beachhead on this planet so that he could redeem back this planet from how Satan had fallen and taken control. And for this, uh, for the last however many thousands of years that this planet has existed, Satan has continued to be the prince and the power of the air, as uh, the apostles described him. He continues to have tremendous control. And when uh, each of the redemptive works that God has done in the redemptive people, from Adam and Eve to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob to, to Jesus, and now the church, has all been his beachhead of the extending of his, this, this kingdom that he eventually will bring about himself. And the entire world will be filled not only with his glory, but the knowledge of his glory. And Christ will rule and reign on this planet. And then there's a new heaven and a new earth. Keep this in mind, by the way, when you're plotting through your day and everything kind of stinks. Remember, this, this, this is warm-up. You know what I mean by that? We're just getting started. The fight is fixed. The fight's already over. Satan doesn't believe that, but it's already fixed. And there's going to come a time when God's going to redeem everything. And part of that was establishing this act of invasion by putting Adam and Eve on this planet. And so we turn to chapter 2, and it describes how in verse 7, now this is where the Hebrew text gets really fun, okay? Verse 7, and the Lord God formed... Watch my hands, a potter's wheel, right? The Lord God formed man, and all the ladies in the room said, amen. He formed man, uh, sturdy, you know, kind of awkward, uh, practical, and so forth. That's, that's what the Hebrew term means. He formed it like on a, on a potter's wheel. Now, when we get to his creation of Eve in a moment, there's a different Hebrew word that's used there. So the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed in him the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. And he planted a garden in Eden, and he put the man there. And he says in verse 9, And out of the ground the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life, was in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was there too. We'll come back to that in, in a later um, discussion. And then it, it goes into detail about this garden, and we come to verse 15. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work, that means to tend, and to keep it, that means to preserve it. And then he said to the man in verse 18, you may surely eat freely of every tree of the garden, but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in that day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. So that was Adam's one memory verse. Are you with me on this, right? Now, ladies, it is not true that God created Eve because he noticed that Adam had not taken a bath in the first three weeks after he created him. That's not true. You may think that's true. But so Adam has this moment where he's commanded by God. And I want to pause here and say that here we have the roots, the seeds of masculine leadership in marriage. Because before Eve was ever created... Adam was created, and the command about the eating of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was given to Adam. And the implication there, very strong implication, is that if any other person came along, walking along or whatever, Adam was to instruct, he was to accept his role as leader, spiritual leader, and instruct whoever came by, you cannot eat of the fruit of this tree. And that's an important distinction because when we get to the New Testament, a lot of the passages that we read about the relationship between men and, uh, men and women, some are cultural, some have a cultural context, and some, the argument goes back to the order of creation and the roles that God established. 
We'll say a lot more about that when we get to Ephesians 5. And so God is uh, looking, I want to get to the end of this chapter, and you can take this uh, outline home and study it for yourself, but I want to get to the end. Verse 18, the Lord said for the first time, it's not good. It's not good that the man should be alone. I will make a helper fit for him. Pause right there because this, my friends, is the beginning of the misunderstanding of the role of husbands and wives. So God made me a helper. I get a helper, right? And she's made fit for me. It's not what the text is saying. The Hebrew word for helper that's used in this verse is the same exact word that God uses to describe himself. God is my helper and my strength. And the word fit in the ESV means to correspond with. So how did he get Adam to even be interested in this? Adam had never seen a woman before. Adam's happily going about doing whatever God commanded him to do, eating all this great fruit and taking care of the garden and having dominion over everything. And then God says, oh, this is not good. So he needs a helper. So out of uh, uh, out of the ground, verse 19, the Lord uh, formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens brought, and brought them to the man. So, and he, and he uh, asked them what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. Now, God was not saying, you know, I've run out of names. I mean, I named those rivers that Gary could barely, barely I, I told Gary, don't worry about how they sound. Nobody knows whether you're right or wrong about it. Just read it, right? So he, he, God's not saying, man, I lost my book on how to name animals. Maybe Adam, that's not the point. What's the point? The point is Adam didn't know he was alone. So he goes out in the field and he sees a cow. He sees Mr. and Mrs. Cow. And he's like, oh, that's interesting. That's utterly interesting. <laughs> I'm just seeing if you're with me, Okay. Then, then he, you know, he sees a giraffe, and there's Mrs. Giraffe, and he sees Squirrel and Mrs. Squirrel, or whatever, however this worked out. And he's, uh, God's, he's, you know, God wants me to name it. So uh, I don't know how many animals he got into before he started going, wait, he has a mate. And he has a mate, and he has. So God was awakening in Adam this longing, this passion, this desire First of all, just to be in relationship. Human relationship is a thing, it's a gift from God. So he's, he's awakening him in that in him, and then he's awakening in uh, him this idea of having a mate. We know, we assume that Adam watched animals mate, and we assume that that was curious to him, right? Are you with me here? Uh, let's demythologize this. This is normal behavior. And so there's something that arose up in him. And so at that point, Adam says, there's not one that corresponds to me. I mean, I don't really want a cow. And I, I'm not pointing at you, Tracy. I'm just... <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's pray. <laughs> Aren't you glad I did that instead of you doing it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I can't marry this stunning peacock. Uh, yeah, right. So this came alive in him, and the awareness of his aloneness, and the awareness of the, uh, the fact that no matter how perfect the garden was and how wonderfully perfect his relationship with God was, there was something else that God was creating in him. And I love the Hebrew text because it says, when God it caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man and he slept, he took one of his ribs. Somebody asked me just the other day, why a rib? And I said, well, because the rib is closest to the heart. Uh, he didn't choose part of the head or the part of the foot. He chose a rib, and he, he closes up this wound. He puts him to sleep, closes it up, and then he creates. And when it says in verse 22, remember uh, formed, 
Remember the, the potter's wheel? Different Hebrew word here. It says, and, when, and God had taken from the man, he made. It means he fashioned like an artist. So fast forward to 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7. When God says to us as husbands, live with your wife in an understanding way, for she is, unfortunately, the English translation always says, a weaker vessel. But what the Hebrew text says is a more delicate instrument. That there has to be in, in a marriage uh, someone who feels things most deeply and who takes things in and who is more delicate in their understanding of relational thing. And that's part of what God was doing there. And then, at, then the man said, verse 23, I love this. This is such a tame translation. This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Let me give you the Hebrew version. Now this one, that's what he says. Now this one, she's like me. And you can, if you remember way back to your first girlfriend or boyfriend and the first time you realized you were kind of falling in love, as we said back then, that moment where this, this, this tingle and all the nerve endings are kind of firing off and you, you're breathing a little. The, Adam has this moment where he's like, this one is totally different from everything else. This one came out of my flesh. She's part of me. She's like me. And that was the beginning of the relationship between men and women. And then Moses, the writer of Genesis, adds this uh, a, a summary at the end. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast, cleave, cling to his wife, and they shall become one flesh, uh, referring to the sexual relationship. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Can you imagine living in a world? Can you imagine living in a world where there's no shame? Yeah, we can imagine that. We have a faint memory and longing for living in a world where there's no anger, there's no shame, there's no guilt, there's no rancor, there's no bitterness, there's no fear. Can you imagine what your life would be like if, if all the negative emotions that control us every day in so many powerful ways, if suddenly they were gone and we were left only to have the purest of emotions and the purest of motives and the deepest, most powerful understanding of our God and our, the most intimate relationship with him and trust. Can you imagine a world where trust existed? See, we're feeling intensely this right now because all of that is off the charts bad in our culture right now. People can't even talk to one another. Husbands and wives can't even speak to one another in civil tones because of an election that's taking place. Children are mistrusting their parents and parents are exasperating their children. The whole world is filled with lawlessness. And all it does is make us long for eternity, long for the remaking of this, right? Amen. And so I said at the end of the first section there, we'll, we'll cover some of this next week, I said all of this is driven by a deep longing to experience Eden again. It's like we know God has placed eternity in our hearts. We know we have this intuition about what the world is supposed to be like, and we know that it's not that way, and that vision is out there before us, and we rush headlong all the time, and it's like there's this giant plexiglass thing, you know, that we pound our face into because we can't get back. And that's why, I, you know, I, I know maybe you get tired of hearing me saying it, but that's why the, just the simplest acts of kindness and love and curiosity and concern are so powerful to people. I had a, I'll finish with this, I had a, um, a great experience this week. One of my dearest friends in the world is a pastor up in Chicago, 
and we were both trying to celebrate our 65th birthday. He was, his was in um, uh, January, mine was in April, and uh, back in April we, we were going to try to meet uh, in the middle and just have a couple of days of celebration. Never could do it because of COVID and all that. And finally, he ends up in Atlanta, I end up in Atlanta, uh, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. And as we're going out to eat in different places that we went, it was amazing to me. I have to, t I got to say this to you again. So there's a young lady named Devin who served us at our table. So Devin, where are you from? You know, what, you know, started this, comp just, you know, curious, holy curiosity. And before you know it, she's sharing with me about her sister and the struggles with her sister and uh, the dreams that she has for her life. And I'm putting her name in my phone to pray for. There's a young couple sitting next to us, and my friend Kurt uh, says to the guy, because he was wearing Converse tennis shoes. Anybody remember Converse tennis shoes? Back when they were really Converse, right? You know, terrible for your feet. Um, this young guy's wearing a modern version of Converse. So my friend says, hey, man, I, I love your shoes. I used to wear those when I played basketball in high school way back. So here we go. Yeah? We've got this young couple uh, in, in this conversation. And before you know it, uh, we're sharing with them and they're asking us to pray for them. Guys, this culture is in trouble. And winning an election is not going to change that. It's just going to change who's in the seats, the scorecard. Only Jesus Christ can change people's lives. Only the grace of God can change people's lives. So when you're out there, just pause and be curious and just find out about people. And I always say, look, do you mind if I, I put you in my phone? I'll pray for you. And, and they can't believe. I'm finding more people who are saying to me, I've never once in my life had someone pray for me. In Christian America, right? So, can I challenge you? Can I encourage you? As you look at what God created for us as human beings, what he longed for and continues to long for us in our relationships with him and with each other. When you read this this week and follow through the outline, we'll talk about it next week, but when you read this and you see the love of our God and the power of our God and the creative nature of our God and what he longs for, for you and for me in our relationship with him and with others, remember, remember that the others that are not part of our other. They're very lonely, very frightened, very anxious people. And they just need a grown adult <laughs> next to them to say it's going to be okay. Jesus said it'll be okay if you trust him. Can we do that this week? Father, we're so grateful that you love us so much. I'm excited to go back now, Lord, and to look and see what you have created for us. And as we work our way to Ephesians 5 to see what you have written for us there about husbands and wives, all of that, Lord, in that passage seems so impossible. It seems so undoable. It seems mammoth, like a mountain to climb, to love that way and to care and to submit to one another and to do the things that you want us to do and to be. Thank you that you've given us your son, not only to, to redeem us, but to live in us. And so this week, would you allow us, please, to interact with, to intersect with, to bump into people who desperately need your love. And as this tension becomes greater and greater in our culture leading up to the day of the election. Lord, please help us to be the ones who are calm and kind and listening and learning and loving and giving. Help us to be generous and effusive in our love for each other and for the others that are not part of us. And I ask it in Jesus' name, amen.
Thank you for your patience. We had a little bit of a uh, technical glitch at the beginning with our Wi-Fi, so uh, we got started late. Uh, so I appreciate so much your patience. We've got some folks uh, visiting with us today, so before you leave, make sure you uh, shake a hand, say hi to someone, or I'm sorry, greet one another with a holy elbow. And uh, um, thanks for coming. You're dismissed. <laughs>